So I'm gonna open up our terminal again, and if I hit Control C, that will stop the Rails application, and if we refresh in our browser, it is no longer running. This is gonna allow me to run another command. I'm gonna use VS Code to open this current directory, which is represented by the period there, and VS Code is going to then put our blog folder over here in the sidebar. I highly recommend using VS Code um, for Rails and Ruby development. It is very easy to use. It has lots of extensions you can use to do different things. Um, you can have it set up for Ruby and Rails, and you can even do things like the standard RB, uh, standard Ruby gem it has an extension to format your code automatically. So if you are forgetting to put spaces or aligning things incorrectly, standard will actually go ahead and format your code for you, which is super cool. So I have a few of these plugins installed. Hey, Chris from the future here. I just wanted to quickly mention when I was editing this that if you don't have the code shortcut in your terminal, you can open up VS Code after you install it and run this shell command install code command in path. Just hit enter and it will run that. Uh, you open that little window up, the command palette up with command shift P on a Mac, probably control shift P on Windows or Linux and that will go and install the little shortcut for code in your terminal. And then in your terminal, you can use editor equals code dash dash wait um, in front of any command that's going to open up a text editor like the Rails credentials edit command, which we'll talk about later. I'll also mention this there, but while you're here, we might as well open up our shells configuration and set this editor code dash dash wait permanently. So if you're on a Mac, a recent Mac that's using Z shell, um, that is going to be the uh, ZSHRC in your home directory. So dot ZSHRC and the tilde there means my home directory. And then in that folder, a file named dot ZSHRC. And at the bottom, you would just add export code editor dash dash wait uh, and save this file and you're good to go. Um, I'm using Vim for this, you could use Nano, you could also use VS Code to edit this file, you might as well. Um, but I've uh, already got Mac Vim set up for myself personally for this, so I'm gonna leave that alone, but you will wanna set VS Code to that. And if you're on Linux or on Windows on WSL, you will want to edit the bash RC file because Linux and WSL, which is running Ubuntu Linux, um, will have bash as the shell primarily, unless you've customized that. And you should already understand all of this anyways then. So if this is brand new to you, add the export editor code dash dash wait to your shell, then you can reopen your shell and it will have the editor uh, available. So if you run echo editor after setting that, it will say code dash dash wait. Perfect. So that's exactly what we want to see. And then anytime we run Rails credentials in the future, we can ignore and leave out this editor stuff because we already set that as an environment variable. So that is it. And I will let you continue on. Peace. And we can go back to the Explorer and take a look at the files that it created for you. So let's start here at the readme. And Rails generates you a markdown file where you can put your own notes for how to set up your Rails application, what database you need, all those other little notes that you might want to have in here. And they suggest a few things like your Ruby version and your dependencies and your configuration things that you might need, like your API keys or whatever that need to be defined. So you can define all of those notes here in the readme. Now let's go back up to the top level files here and take a look at a couple of these are git configuration files and they start with .git. Um, and the one we really care about is git ignore. And this defines a bunch of files and folders that we want to keep out of our git repository. So for example, things like temporary file uploads that you might be doing in development or testing, we don't want to save those to our git repository. So those are listed here um, by default, but also there's some important ones like your config master.key, which allows you to decrypt your Rails credentials which is used for API keys and other secrets that you need to store in your application. Um, this allows you to encrypt that file, but you don't ever save the key to decrypt it. 
in your Git repository, because if anybody got access to your Git repository, they could steal all your tokens, which would be bad. So that's why the key is ignored, so it does not get saved to your Git repo, but you need to make sure to save that somewhere safe. We'll talk about Rails credentials in the future. You don't need that for basic things, um, unless you're doing uh, credentials with API tokens and things like that. So the Ruby version file is generated by default, and this is what ASDF or other version managers like RBM, RVM, uh, CHRuby, all of those will look for a .ruby version file in your directory and say, oh, you wanna use Ruby 321? We'll make sure that we do. And it will warn you and say, hey, Ruby 321 is not installed, make sure you install it. And when you switch between directories, it looks for this file and says, okay, We'll use that version of Ruby. So if you switch to an older application that uses Ruby 2.7 or 3.0, it will switch to those versions automatically. Config.ru is a file for Rack to help start your Rails application. Rails is built on Rack, which is a sort of web framework for Ruby that most of the web frameworks like Rails will build on top of. So it's a lightweight HTTP sort of processor for you, which is cool. Um, your gem file is standard to any Ruby application. This lists all your dependencies. It also can ensure that your Ruby version matches as well. And here is where we define that we're using Rails 704 um, and our other dependencies, like you saw Puma when we started their web server for Rails. And here's our Hotwire JavaScript stuff for Turbo and Stimulus. We have a JBuilder for creating JSON APIs and a bunch of other things in here that ship by default with Rails. Your gem file lock is an important file because when you run bundle, it will read this gem file, install those with the matching version requirements that you've defined here, and it will write all those current versions that it's using to the lock file. So this is used when you deploy to production to make sure you get the exact same versions that you tested with in development, and you don't accidentally get a slightly newer version that might cause some problem in production. It ensures that what you have locked when you were doing development is exactly the same thing in production. Now your rake file is a place where you can define uh, little one-off commands. Like when we run Rails new, it runs a tool called rake um, to actually generate things for you or run commands. So when we run, um, different commands like Rails new or Rails DB migrate. Uh, these are tasks uh, in general that will be defined as a name and, like DB migrate, and it will go look that up, find the location for it, and execute that command for you. So you don't have to worry about that too much. Um, you won't really mess with this very often, but it is uh, generated with you by default so that uh, you can use those right tasks. Uh, the app folder is where most of your work will be done. This contains a folder for assets like style sheets and images that you might want to have um, displayed on your HTML. Channels is a folder for your action cable web sockets. So if you're using Slack or Discord, messages are coming back and forth in real time. Those are using web sockets and not HTTP requests because an HTTP request is a uh, single request and that's it. You have to ask for something, they send you a response back and that's it. But with WebSockets, it's an open connection between your computer and the web server, uh, whatever website you were talking to, and the website can send you messages and you can send it messages and it can do all that conversation um, in real time, which is awesome. We'll talk about using that in the future, but for now, it is not, it's kind of more of an advanced feature that we will talk about later instead of right now. Uh, your controllers are what control what happens when a website request comes in. So someone makes an HTTP request for a page, it goes to your controller and it says, okay, we need to look up this blog post from the database and create HTML to display that and then send that back to the user. So the controllers decide what to do when a request comes in. Helpers are used for uh, rendering your HTML. So if you have like a user's avatar that you can look up with a service, 
like you give it their email and it looks up an avatar for them like Gravatar does. Uh, you can define a helper that helps you write that HTML to create the image tag for Gravatar, for example. Uh, App JavaScript, of course, is for your JavaScript, which is where your things like Hotwires, Turbo, and Stimulus will be loaded, and you can define your own JavaScript in there. Um, jobs is for background jobs. So if we have a background job to parse a CSV upload, or maybe we have a background job that runs to publish our blog posts at a certain time, those can be defined under app jobs. Um, app mailers is for sending emails. And app models is for creating database models that represent like the database's users table. And every user has a name and some users may be like spammers and they're marked as spam and the models can define how to look up uh, records in that database table, but also how to interact with an individual record to update it or delete it or create a new one. And all of that is handled under app models. Then app views is where you define your HTML or your JSON responses and you define your views in there that your controller decides to render. The bin folder has a couple executables to, for example, run bundle or rails or rake or setup. And these will basically just make sure that it loads rails correctly. It uh, runs the correct version of bundler and so on. This one will make sure that your database and your dependencies and other rails uh, setup things are done properly. Now the config folder has a bunch of stuff in here. We're gonna look at the files first. Application RB defines some settings for all of your Rails environments. So when you create a Rails app, there's a test environment for you to run your automated tests against. There's a development environment for you to run and actually work in. And then there's a production environment that runs in production on your hosting service that uh, is designed for speed. So development allows you to change files without having to reload your Rails app. Your test environment tries to replicate production, but change some things so it never really sends out real emails or you know other configuration changes that you wouldn't want. Um, but you do want to kind of emulate production. So each of those environments is loaded under the environments folder and application.rb is kind of where it sets all the defaults and says, hey, we want all the settings for Rails version seven. We might want to tell it what time zone our application is running in. And all of this sets up those settings before the environments go and change their individual tweaks. Boot.rb basically says, hey, here's where our gem file is. Let's run Bundler to set up and make sure that all our dependencies are uh, loaded. And Bootsnap is a cool tool that basically caches um, seamlessly behind the scenes caches your dependencies so it's a little bit faster to load your Rails app. Cable.yaml is for action cable for configuring your WebSocket backend, which uh, is typically Redis by default, but you can also use any pub sub service. Postgres has one built in, for example. And this is what it uses to, in real time, send those messages back and forth. Uh, your encrypted credentials.yaml file is what is the, de the encrypted file that you will decrypt with that master key that I mentioned earlier. Um, there's a special Rails command to decrypt this file to edit it, which we'll talk about in a future episode. Your database YAML defines how to connect to your database. So with SQLite, you just tell it what file are on your disk. Uh, you need to use and that's it, but you can also use Postgres or MySQL and have it talk to those servers. Environment.rb initializes your Rails application and then it basically goes to your environments and figures out which one you're using and executes this. Um, and for example, your Rails development doesn't do any caching uh, by default so that your code can be reloaded automatically and it will set up some extra things like include some server timing details. Uh, you can configure your file uploads and how your emails are defined and other things like that. So it kind of defines each of those differently so that you can tweak the performance stuff for production, yada, yada, yada. Um, Puma.rb defines how Puma runs and in production, you'll wanna configure this so that your server might have 
eight CPUs and you can modify this to make it take full advantage of those eight CPUs and however many threads um, that your production server takes advantage of. So this by default, don't need to touch it, but when you get into production stuff, you can tweak this to make it work really efficient um, and take full advantage of the server you give it. Config routes.rb defines your application's URLs. So when you go to Google and you go to google.com, this is the root URL, which is just a uh, slash here at the end. But if we go to about, it's gonna take us to a different page. This one doesn't actually have a route itself, but here, if we go to the blog on Ruby on Rails, you would define a blog route in your routes file and tell it, hey, we wanna to go to the blogs controller and load up all of our blog posts. So there's a lot that you can do with your routes. You'll spend a lot of time in there kind of defining what URLs we have on our website and which controllers to send them to. Storage YAML defines where you can upload files to. So if you're using active storage for file uploads, you can say, hey, for the test environment, we just wanna store them in the temp directory so we can clear them out when we're done. The local development will just store on disk. And then in production, we could maybe upload files to Amazon S3 or Google or Microsoft's Azure storage, or we could do a combination of them with a mirror system. So this allows you to define where those go and then your different environments can choose which one of those makes the most sense for it. Your DB folder has your SQLite database in it and a couple of things that will be created later is the migrations folder and migrations themselves. Those define how you add a new table or you add a new column or you remove one or you modify it. Each change to your database is created as a migration so you can go and add those changes or work backwards and undo those changes if you made a mistake. So that will be created automatically for us later on when we create some database things. And your seeds file allows you, once you've created those migrations and run them, you can create seeds that say, hey, my blog needs to have some categories or other records, like maybe the admin user, and we can create seeds to go pre-populate our database with some data that we can use, like our blog post categories. Then our lib directory is where you can put some extra uh, libraries, so you can put it under assets, or you can create your own rake tasks in here. There's nothing in there by default, um, and typically you're not spending much time in there. The log directory keeps track of all of your requests. Uh, you saw those in the terminal, but they also get written to this log file. So you can go back here and say, okay, we when we loaded the Rails homepage, it went to the root route, made a get request, and then the Rails welcome controller was the one that processed that. Uh, and the HTML it rendered was this file, and that actually lived inside the Railties uh, gem that was installed. So here's the full path to that file that it rendered, and then it returned, the controller returned, a 200 OK response in 15 milliseconds. So you can use this to analyze your requests and see errors and other things that are going on. Your public directory contains a bunch of files like your favicon um, or your error pages. So if your Rails app breaks, it will render out this 500 error page instead. Um, and you can put static files in there like maybe your logo or something that doesn't need to change. You can just drop that in your public folder. Storage is used for file upload storage. Uh, it's just created there. It's intended to stay um, empty in your Git repository, but you will add your file uploads there automatically when you're doing your development work. The test directory has all the similar um, folders as app does because this is where you would write your automated tests to make fake requests or create database records or verify that errors are rendered properly when I do something wrong. Um, we'll create automated tests for testing our Rails app in the future episodes. Then the last two folders, we have temp, which stores some of our testing file uploads, our uh, cache data, and other things like that. Don't have to worry much about this folder. 
Uh, and then vendor, if you want to take like jQuery and download it and put it in your application, you'd put it under vendor JavaScript so that you would have your JavaScript from some third party vendor in this folder and you could update it automatically, but it kind of separates it out from your own JavaScript and says, hey, this is some extra code from somewhere else that we want to keep ourselves in the repository because we need it, but uh, we don't want it to be confused and we don't want anybody to edit that because it's some third party code. So that is the entire application structure for your Rails applications. There's a lot that is here, but I wanted to get you familiar with it before we dig in because we're going to write a lot of different files and understanding the directories and the files and their purposes is helpful to kind of get in easier to building your Rails apps. So now let's go build something in our blog application to make it do something real.